Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this information session for families. My name is Sherry Lynn Ferrand, and I'm the Director of Education with the Kiwait and Patricia District School Board, and I'm pleased to welcome you here this evening. Um, also on the live stream with us, uh, we have our senior team, uh, Richard Finley, Superintendent of Business, Joan Cantola, Superintendent of Education, Jane Lower, Superintendent of Education, Shannon Bailey, Superintendent of Education, Sheena Pilipetian, um, Communications Officer, Brian Beal, Manager of Information Technologies, and Brenda Baradell, who is our recorder for this evening and Executive Secretary uh, with Kuwait and Patricia. So thank you to everyone um, for joining us. And um, I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that um, families and uh, students and staff within the Red Lake area are um, struggling with a difficult time right now. Our thoughts are with them all as they have all uh, evacuated to safety. And uh, we wish for them um, safety, health and well-being. And uh, thank the firefighters who are willing as well to uh, fight the fire. And um, we hope for uh, all of the best. Know that our thoughts are with each and every one of our staff, uh, students, families, and our Red Lake community. We know that this is a very stressful time for everyone. Um, and it's been um, stressful since March 13th as our world has changed. And it's why our guiding principles as we return to school are founded on health, safety, and well being of our students, our staff, and all of our communities. That health, safety, and well being is a top priority. Our plans are founded on information from the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario, the Ministry of Education, and the Northwest Health Unit. You will note that our school year calendar has been adapted and we'll begin this year with three PA days in order to allow staff to practice all of the new health and safety protocols that are required to keep all of us safe together at school. Our supply staff will also receive the same training. We also want you to know that we understand whether or not you send your child back to bricks and mortar school or choose virtual learning, that it is a difficult choice and that whatever choice you make is the right choice for you and your family and we at KP will support that decision. We are hosting this session and providing an overview um, for each of the areas from elementary and secondary uh, education, special education, mental health and well being, and transportation and health and safety protocols so that you can have uh, additional information as you make your decision. We know the survey came out in, a, in advance of detailed information, and it's why the survey deadline is not until August 17th. Just a reminder for families that we do require the survey information in order to allow us to carefully plan for the health and safety of each and every school building, the staff in it, and the students who attend. The survey can be found on kpdsb.on.ca, on social media, through emails directly to families. Um, and to date, we have had a significant response and approximately 10% of families are choosing virtual learning. Note, um, as we go through the information this evening, that as you have um, noticed since March, um, as we know more through science, guidance and advice has changed, and as the virus has moved and changed, um, guidance and advice has changed. So all of our plans this evening are subject to change based on the best information from the medical officers of health available at the time. This particular session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for any families who were unable to join us live this evening. The link will be emailed out to families tomorrow along with a written guide to help support families with information and making decisions. We will be taking live questions and answers at the end, 
and we'll go through as many as possible. Just a, rem a reminder that you're invited to send any questions that you may have to questions at kpdsb.ca. Please note that we have approximately an hour and a half scheduled for this evening's session. And if we aren't able to get to all of the questions, we will provide a written response as well as include all questions on our Frequently Asked Questions page for parents. If for any reason there are technical issues during this session and we lose the feed, we will email families and post on social media about how to rejoin, and we will make sure that the full recording is available on our YouTube channel. So with that, um, I'm pleased to turn it over to Superintendent Shannon Bailey, who will begin with an overview of elementary education. Thank you, Sherry Lynn. Good evening, my name is Shannon Bailey and I'm the Superintendent of Education for the KPDSB, overseeing elementary schools, early learning, Indigenous education and learning technology. I live in Kenora and I'm also the parent of a grade six daughter who attends Valley View School. Along with you all, I had a decision to make about whether or not my child would be returning to school in person or selecting a remote learning option. My husband and I, along with our daughter, have selected to send her back to school. We know that as families, this decision is not easy and your decision may be different than ours because our context may be different. As Sherry Lynn said, at KPDSB, we are here to support you in making the decision that is right for your family. We value your questions and input and hope that sharing our plans this evening, as long as with the follow-up parent guide, that you feel equipped to make the decision that works best for you and your children. I'm going to share information with you this evening about our conventional return, which is how we have been currently directed by the Ministry of Education to return to school this September. We know that there are many questions and concerns about making the decision as to whether or not families should select to return to school in person or through the remote delivery option. And if you do have any additional questions following this session, just a reminder that you can email your questions to questions at kpdsb.ca. Elementary school students in kindergarten through grade eight who will attend in person will attend school five days per week with 300 minutes of instruction per day. Students will remain in one cohort for the full day, including recess and lunch. Enhanced safety and health protocols will be in place. Schools will provide 300 minutes per day of synchronous and asynchronous virtual learning for students who do not wish to return in person. There are set time frames where families can change between remote learning and in-person learning that correlate with assessment periods. Remote learning will look different than it did during school closure last year. Daily attendance will be taken and students will be reported on all remote learning activities. There will be 300 minutes of learning opportunities, both synchronous and asynchronous, large group instruction, guided instruction, either small group or individual, independent asynchronous work available in Google Classroom, Brightspace, or other approved virtual learning environment. We will continue to support and work with families and communities to provide options to help support connecting to virtual learning or through other means if this is not possible, as equity is a critical part of all of our planning. The teachers who will be providing the remote learning will be determined based on the return to school survey data that families will provide by August the 17th. The plan for remote learning will be communicated to families through the school principals. Students in elementary, K through eight, will not be on a quadmastering system like the secondary students. However, there will still be dates aligned with reporting periods at which time families may select different learning format. For example, remote to in-person or vice versa. Those elementary change dates, which families must notify their child's school two weeks prior to, are November the 2nd and February the 1st. I'm going to talk to you now about what the in-person school format will look like. Students in kindergarten through grade three will be encouraged but not required to wear masks. Students in grades four to 12 will be required to wear non-medical or cloth masks indoors on school property, including in the hallways and classrooms. Students may bring their own masks or use the masks provided by the school. If families wish to send hand sanitizers, they may, but we will ensure to provide hand sanitizer and hand washing areas in classrooms and school areas. Staff will be required to wear medical grade masks and will have face shields available as well as other PPE 
provided in cases where they cannot socially distance. Classes from kindergarten through to grade eight will remain in one cohort for the day. For instruction of second languages or other subjects, the teachers in most cases will move to the students rather than students moving to another space. If they do move to another space, it will be cleaned in between cohorts. Direct and indirect contacts in schools for elementary students will be limited to approximately 50 students. We will continue to be flexible and responsive to the public health data and recognize that we may need to adjust plans and practices based on current health information. This will be an ongoing process throughout the year. We have planned for all possible learning models in the event that we need to change how we operate. While all school procedures and practices will align with system-wide plans, the implementation may look different from school to school based on the local school environment and unique school circumstances. There will be changes in the timing of recesses, lunches, and washroom breaks as they are staggered to support cohorting. Students will also be able to leave their classrooms to receive additional support in limited groupings or in a one-to-one -one format. Any teacher or staff working in close proximity to the student will use PPE. Specialized programs that involve mixing, of, mixing cohorts of students will be on hold or redesigned until such time as cohorting is not required. Information about specific classes and programs will be communicated in school-based plans by the school principals. Outdoors, students will be part of arrival and exit plans, protocols for lunch, as well as staggered nutritional breaks so students are outside at different times. Equipment for playing outside will be cleaning will be cleaned as needed. There will be washroom protocols in place for both inside and outside times. There will be enhanced cleaning protocols in shared spaces outdoors as well. Inside the classroom, schools will focus on a sense of community, belonging and relationship building. In the physical layout of the classroom, any unnecessary furniture will be removed to, re to um, have extra space available for students in the classroom. Teachers will have a space at the front of the classroom that is a teaching zone and allows distancing to happen. Student items will be labeled. Desks or student tables will be placed as far apart as possible in order to support social distancing. Student items may be kept in the classroom. Lockers may be used if assigned to one student only and can be accessed in a way that does not have congestion in the hallways. Families are asked to limit the amount of personal items that are sent to school. There will be regular scheduled hand washing times, procedures for small group instruction. Gym classes will be outdoors as much as possible. In kindergarten, recognizing that physical distancing is difficult with small children, additional suggestions will come from daycare planning documents and special considerations that are um, more adapt to small children. If sensory materials are offered, they will be provided for single use and labeled with the child's name in their own space. In the hallway, supervision will be in place. There will be no access to water fountains except for our bottle filling stations. There will be cleaning of high traffic areas performed regularly, arrows on the floor to support physical distancing, and extra hand washing and sanitizing stations provided. Washrooms will have frequent cleaning with day daytime custodians available in all of our schools monitoring of who goes in and out of shared spaces and assigned washroom breaks for classes when um, they're going as a class. Late registration protocol for elementary, parents should have indicated through the survey whether students are attending in person or remotely by August the 17th. Schools will contact families who have not completed the survey at that time to determine if they are returning or participating through virtual instruction. If families wish to register after the start of the school year, they can make an appointment to do so. Please expect a delay in the start date if that is the case. For visitors protocol, visitor access will be restricted and by appointment where possible. Deliveries will be accepted outside the school whenever possible as well. Other considerations that we have taken into our planning processes, schools will be developing their plans to support students around the new rules, especially younger students who may be unaware as COVID-19 may be invisible to them. Schools will share images or videos of schools and classrooms prior to the start of school, so students and families have an opportunity to see the changes. Just a reminder to please fill out the KPDSB return to school survey by August the 17th. 
And if you have further questions regarding the elementary planning, remember to send your questions in by email this evening or following this session at questions at kpdsb.ca. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. I'll ask Superintendent Jane Lower to continue with the secondary plan for this evening. Hello, everybody. My name is Jane Lower, and I'm a recent um, employee of the Kuwait and Patricia School Board. I began um, my position here on August the 1st, and I would like to um, say that it was an incredibly warm welcome from community uh, staff and, and the team I'm currently work, working with. So I'm looking forward to working with students and staff and families uh, in, in this upcoming school year. For the secondary model, um, I'd like to say that whether families and students choose to return to school uh, in a face-to-face -face model, the conventional model, or to learn remotely, Kiwait and Patricia secondary school students will start with five days of learning each week and will have the option to participate in eight courses during the 2021 school year. Secondary schools will continue to provide students 110 instructional hours per course in a full instructional day. Our secondary timetables will be scheduled in 2021 as quadmesters, where students will participate in two courses for a duration of 45 days. A quadmester system reduces the number of student transitions during a school day and therefore the number of direct and indirect contacts. With the quadmester schedule, students will take two courses per day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Each class will consist of 150 instructional minutes. By June 25th, 2021, most of our students will have completed eight courses within four quadmesters. Quadmester one, will run from September the 3rd until November the 6th. Students will be in, a semester, in their semester one period one class in the morning, followed by a lunch break, and then move to their semester one period two class in the afternoon. Quadmester two, November 9th to January 28th, students will be in their semester one period three class in the morning, followed by lunch, and then move to their semester one period four class in the afternoon. Quad three will run from January 29th to April 13th. Students will then be in their semester two period one class in the morning, followed by lunch, and then their semester two period two class in the afternoon. And the final quadmester for April 14th to June 25th, where students will have their semester two period three lunch in the morning, and in the afternoon, their semester two period four class. Exams or culminating activities will be scheduled at the end of each quadmester, followed by the distribution of final report cards to families and students. A typical day for a return to school in this model would look like students arrive at school, they'll enter the school through a designated door, and they'll proceed to their period one class. Period one will run the entire morning, 150 minutes. Students will have scheduled breaks both in the morning and in the afternoon. Following period one, there will be a lunch break. Lunch will, lunch will be um, assigned, students will be assigned to designated areas in the school. And some schools, depending on the size and the population, will be, um, there'll be a staggered dismissal for lunch. After lunch, students will proceed to period two for their second class of the day and for 150 instructional minutes. There will be a uh, scheduled break in the afternoon as well. At the end of the school day, students will be dismissed. Depending on the size of the school, dismissals may be staggered. With this model, students will transition into the school um, and go through two transitions a day, two classes today, which significantly reduces the number of transitions made by students in a, a typical school day. The quadmester system will also be used should a cho student choose to learn remotely. Students who choose to learn in a virtual um, way will also be engaging in two courses per day for 45 days, 150 instructional minutes per course, which will be taught both synchronously and asynchronously by their teacher. There will be a late registration protocol. Parents have been um, indicating through the survey whether their child will attend school 
in person or remotely. This survey, as you've heard, is open until Monday, August the 17th. If families wish, wish to register after the start of the school year, they can make appointments with their school. Should a student wish to make a change from remote learning to in-person learning, there will be a two-week window before each quadmester to make the necessary timetable change and for the student to be added to classes and also to the bus schedule if necessary. This period of time, two weeks before each quadmester, will also be used for students who wish to change from a face-to-face -face model of learning to a remote model of learning. We recognize, however, that there may be unique circumstances and decisions to make changes from remote to um, physical will be made accordingly and as quickly as we can. We will try to accommodate all requests in a timely fashion. Changing courses will not be as fluid as it has in the past, whether that be from a virtual to a face-to-face -face physical environment or vice versa. Students and families will be reminded of the two-week window before the quadmester and supported as they make changes, if they make changes. Should there be increased cases of COVID in our area, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Health may direct us to move either to an adapted or a full virtual model for student safety. The adapted model will see students participate in the learning, physical learning environment for 50% of the learning time, 50% of a quadmester, and 50% as a virtual learning environment. That means half the students in the class would attend school um, for two or three days a week and half the students would learn remotely. That is called the adapted model. A remote situation um, would be students learn remotely 100% of the time and in an asynchronous and synchronous fashion. In the physical environment, classes um, will be decluttered and cleaned regularly. Students will be seated in individual desks or spaced out at tables. Rooms will have signage and there will be a zone at the front of the class for um, teachers. Washroom breaks will be staggered. Um, designated washrooms will be assigned to classes or cohorts and protocols will be in place. Cleaning will be um, regular and often during the school day. During the lunch hour, students who remain at school will have a designated area assigned during lunch and hygiene protocols will be followed. For breakfast and lunch programs, schools will deliver um, any food, any breakfast and lunch programs as a grab and go, um, no touch way of distributing um, food and lunches. All surfaces, bins and containers for food will be disinfected prior to and after each use. Lockers will not be available for secondary students during the first week of September. Students will go directly to their class after entering the school. Students may begin to use their lockers once a plan is in place for groups of students to go to their locker with physical distancing protocol in place. The decision to use lockers will be up to schools to determine um, physical protocols, uh, physical distancing protocols based on the school circumstances. Until students are assigned lockers, students will keep their belongings in their classroom. Belongings should be limited, backpack and lunch, for example, and students should not share belongings. For students who arrive late to school during the school day, there will be a protocol for arrival. Um, it, they may or may not in, enter the office, but attendance will be taken and they'll start their class when they arrive. Visitors to the school will be limited and by appointment only, and shared spaces in the school, such as four directions, guidance, um, the library, may or may not be open at the start and will require physical distancing and schedule cleaning throughout the day. For subjects in secondary school, there are some um, subjects that will follow resources and protocols um, provided by the Ministry of Education or other uh, ministry guidelines. So for example, in physical education, overall expectations will be completed outdoors whenever possible. Gymnasiums will only be used when physical distancing can be followed. Capacity and change rooms will be limited. Activities will support physical distancing and will limit the use of shared equipment. Shared equipment will be disinfected between use. Physical education classes will follow OFIA and ministry guidelines. 
students should follow proper hand hygiene before and after phys ed classes. For music classes, schools will follow the OMEA resource, cooperative education, most or many of our cooperative education will be offered virtually if feasible. And if it is an in-person co-op placement, then community placements must follow the recommendations of the local health unit. Technology class, the regular safety curriculum is required and shared equipment will be disinfected between use. Drama and dance classes will follow the code guideline and there are resources for adapted strategies in, the, in these classes. Literacy requirement for graduation. Ontario secondary school literacy test is planned for both semesters of the 2021 school year and the EQAO grade nine math assessment may be online in 2021 and students in grade 10 who were not able to take the math assessment in grade nine will be um, allowed to write it this upcoming year. Community service hours. Graduating students will continue to need to meet the required 40 volunteer hours for graduation and virtual volunteering is acceptable. I hope this answers many of your questions. Please continue to send in your emails and I look forward to um, supporting you and communicating with you so we could support your children in the 2021 school year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. I'll ask Superintendent Cantola to continue with special education and mental health. Thank you, Sherry Lynn. Uh, welcome KP families. It's my pleasure this evening to speak to you about uh, supporting students with special education needs. All of our staff at Kiwait and Patricia will continue to focus on the support of students with special education needs as schools begin to reopen. To begin, I'd like to share with you some information about our transition planning for special education students. Beginning next Monday, October, October, August the 17th, a summer transition planning team will be in place for two weeks prior to the first day of school to support school-based teams to ensure a seamless transition back to school for special education students that may require some additional supports. School teams will reach out to families to discuss transition planning for special education students. All students with special education needs will have attendance options, including daily in-school attendance or full remote virtual learning as indicated when you complete your family survey. I'd like to address some supports and services um, and resources that will be available to school-based teams and families. Families and caregivers who choose full virtual learning will have access to a resource teacher and any other supports that are identified in your child or children's individual education plan. Students that have complex medical needs will also have the option to attend daily and staff will be provided with the appropriate protective equipment, remote learning uh, where school is not possible for these students. Uh, schools will collaborate with families and caregivers and healthcare providers to ensure that supports um, and are developed and organized to meet the individual needs of the students. All students with special education needs who choose to engage in full virtual learning will have live contact with a teacher and access to any additional supports as indicated in the individual education plan. It's really important to note, and I strongly encourage, that if your child or children have received support from an educational assistant in this past school year, that you communicate directly with your school resource teacher to confirm what level of support your child or children will have in the 2021 school year. Enhanced uh, personal protective equipment, uh, support and training uh, will be ongoing for staff and it will be provided on the first PD day as previously mentioned. So all staff are familiarized and become comfortable with the protective equipment that will be required for the staff, which whatever their role may be. Safety plans may be required for some students and will continue to be developed and on a needs basis. Individual education plans, IEPs, 
Schools will follow the requirements to provide students with their IEPs in collaboration with the IEP team, which involves parents, guardians, caregivers. Any changes that might be required in school environments and or for full virtual learning needs will be considered uh, and and embedded uh, in the IEP when creating and updating these documents. In school support team meetings will continue to move forward in a full face to face or a virtual learning environment. School support teams and IPRC meetings will continue either face to face or through um, uh, a Google platform of, of some sort to ensure that we plan uh, to um, adequately support all special education students. Professional support services and other members of the team will continue to be included in these very important meetings. For example, might be a psychologist, speech language pathologist, and applied behavioral support staff, special education leaders, or teacher diagnosticians, or yourselves. Um, may be in attendance as these meetings continue to move forward. Itinerant staff being central staff um, that, that manage and support regional and help to organize regional support services, such as autism support services within our communities, rehabilitation, mental health, uh, blind and low vision supports from community partners uh, and resources for deaf and hard of hearing students. All of these services will continue to support students in a full virtual environment or a full face to face environment. We will be meeting with our community partners early next week uh, to ensure that we have full understanding um, of each other's protocols and that the the rehab and the mental health staff that will be uh, joining um, and supporting our school teams to support students face to face, understand the medical protocols and that they have an appropriate designated space to work with students in our schools. The organization of these mental health and rehabilitation supports uh, will be the responsibility of school-based administration to ensure that they have appropriate spaces uh, for these very valuable uh, community partners to continue to work and serve our students. Special education SIA equipment, which is specialized equipment um, and technology that we apply for our um, unique funding so that we can support our students to ensure that they are ready uh, and supported for learning. Applications for additional equipment and technology will continue to move forward in the new school year as well. Just in conclusion around the specific special education uh, supports, I just want to share with you that our central uh, special education team will continue to provide ongoing support for school-based teams, for families and students to ensure a healthy transition back to school. School teams will continue to monitor the needs of special education students to determine what the priorities are as we move into the new year. And we can then make appropriate adjustments to the various levels of supports and services. I'd like to share a little bit of information around mental health, the mental health service model. Mental health, equity, and student learning have always been important in Ontario schools and have been a priority across all of our Kiwait and Patricia uh, schools. There has never been a time when these priorities have ever been more essential. To be ready to learn, students need to feel that strong sense of safety, belonging, and well-being at school. A focus on student mental health through, for example, welcoming and caring environments, regular opportunities for social emotional learning and student led initiatives, encouraging self care, stigma reduction and help seeking. These are the kinds of supports um, learning uh, to ensure equitable outcomes for all of our students. So to support a mentally healthy return to school, our school leaders have the following priorities at heart. They will demonstrate a clear commitment to student mental health, create caring 
uh, conditions for learning to help students and families to access mental health supports and services. We have a commitment to maintain the following uh, foundational principles. Mental health and well being will be our priority. Our commitment to enhance and protect mental health and well being as we return to school is the foundation for setting conditions for students to thrive across all of our schools. We will lead with compassion and empathy. We will listen and hear the concerns of parents and families and offer factual information that can help everyone in this difficult time. In addition, we know that our schools are excellent places to continue to promote and protect student mental health. We will make every effort to identify when a child or a youth might be struggling and assist students and families to access school or community-based mental health services. We already have strong foundational uh, supports uh, that we have built across all of our schools. Our commitment is to ensure that we are well positioned to support student uh, mental health and well being through this incredibly challenging time for all of us. That we need to work together. This pandemic has shown us new ways of moving forward together. As a first step, it's important for all of us to work together and to reestablish those caring relationships that are foundational in welcoming, uh, creating welcoming and inclusive classroom environments that support student learning. I am sure that there are many unanswered questions out there and I encourage all of you to um, submit your questions uh, to, as you have previously heard, questions at kpdsb.ca. And thank you for um, allowing me to share. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm going to ask uh, Superintendent Finley to continue with the health and safety protocols, which I know are top of mind for everyone. Thank you, Sherry Lynn. Uh, my name is Richard Finley. I'm the Superintendent of Business. I oversee facilities, transportation, learning, technology, and finance. I'll speak today about health and safety, enhanced cleaning protocols, and busing. So first, health and safety. The safety, and the well being of our students and staff is our top priority at KP. Schools will be set up to ensure the safety of our students and staff following medical officer of health directives and protocols. Having said that, these could change what we say one week, could be different the next week, but we'll roll with the uh, punches and uh, continue to follow the protocols in place at the time. So the first thing we're, we'll have is a self-assessment questionnaire where before people, staff and students show up for school, they'll have to do a self-assessment. They'll sign in for contact tracing purposes at the entrance of the school. There will be a foot pump hand sanitizing station set up not only at the entrance of the school, but throughout the school as well. There will be signage and decals uh, throughout the school for, uh, with reminders for social distancing to stay two meters apart. There will be directional markings on hallway floors and walls just to remind students and staff to stay in their lane. Places like guidance offices, there will be two chairs across the room from each other. All the rest of the chairs will be removed for social distancing purposes. Classrooms will have hand washing instructions above sinks and also there will be signage to continually remind people about the social distancing aspect. PPE personal protective equipment. That includes things like masks, face shields, gowns, gloves. Now, for the most part, our staff uh, will be using, well, our, our staff in the schools will be wearing masks. If they are going to be less than two meters apart uh, from students, they will also be wearing face shields. Gowns and gloves would normally be just for extreme cases uh, where they have to be very hands-on with a student. Washrooms will be cleaned regularly, but not after each use. Enhanced cleaning, so what does that mean? We'll have one custodian on a day shift in each school, at least one custodian. There'll be increased cleaning with disinfectants that'll occur throughout the day on high touch areas, including things like washrooms, lunch areas, uh, tables, desks, after uh, students uh, 
finish the reading periods. Photocopiers, phones, uh, drinking fountains will be bagged off, but the bottle filling station will be available for use. They'll also be wiping door handles, light switches, entrance door, push bars, stair rails, anywhere where there's a um, high touch area. Facilities department will uh, monitor sanitization and disinfecting supplies in each school and stock as required so we don't run low. Shared objects, things like uh, gym or cassette equipment, art supplies, toys, games, all the use of shared objects like this will be limited when possible or objects will be cleaned between each use. As an example, uh, we talked about uh, internally about shop tools, visette uh, equipment. It just makes sense that after the each class is over that the students would probably be trained by the teacher at the start of the year or the start of the semester how to clean the, the tools and or gym equipment uh, rather than wait around and have it wait for a custodian to do it. Staffing for enhanced cleaning, because we'll have custodians in the school during the day, we will backfill their shift, their evening shifts with casual staff. We already have the casual staff um, set up with the board and we are able to call in the casuals to support full-time custodians as needed. Uh, we will be posting, uh, doing job postings for casual custodians and or uh, term positions for the year. So if you know anybody that's looking for a job, um, give them a heads up. Busing. Um, we're encouraging families to make alternative arrangements if possible, because we, if all the students that normally took the bus want to take the bus, there may not be enough room. Currently, we would, uh, when we plan for busing, we load some of the runs at uh, typically 110 to 130% of capacity, because normally uh, buses run at about 80% capacity. In this case now, uh, it'll be assigned seating for contact tracing purposes. This has been uh, mandated by the Medical Officer of Health. Um, so what this means, it, it's not one seat, one, sorry, it's not one child per seat. For grade four to 12 students, masks are mandatory. For K to three, optional, but encouraged that they wear masks. Um, the board will be supplying masks for the students on the bus. Uh, however, if you wish to have your own mask for your child, uh, you're welcome to do that. Bus drivers will wear mask and face shield um, when they're driving for safety reasons. If they want to remove the face shield, that's fine. If they can drive with the mask on, that's fine. But if they need to remove it for safety reasons, that's okay too. There will be enhanced cleaning for the buses. They'll at least twice a day, probably after the morning run and the afternoon run. Hand sanitizer will be available on the bus. And um, with the loading of buses to capacity, that means more than one child per seat. Siblings will be placed beside siblings first in the assigned seating, and then classmates will uh, follow suit as the second priority. That's all I have for that. Um, if you have any questions, you can email them to questions at kpdsb.ca. And looking forward to starting a new school year safely and uh, we'll be nimble and be flexible and just be kind to people. Everybody's doing their best under these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to take some time now to address the question that I think is probably top of everyone's mind, and that's what happens if someone gets sick while they're at school? We have uh, worked with the Northwest Health Unit to develop uh, protocols for if students um, or staff show symptoms while they are at school. Every school will have a designated room that is um, an area where they uh, can be separated from other staff and students. Schools are expected to promptly separate the students and children and staff who show symptoms of illness from others into a supervised area until they're able to go home. The child, your child will be supervised, um, ideally at a distance of two meters um, between them and the staff person supervising them. 
If they are very ill, staff will wear uh, appropriate PPE and will um, look after the child. Hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette are to be reinforced and practiced um, while the ill person is waiting to be picked up uh, by their family. Tissues will be provided and all tissues should be disposed of into lined garbage bags and hand hygiene should be performed by the ill person after coughing or sneezing. Environmental cleaning of the space that the student or child who was ill was in will be conducted once they have been picked up. The school leadership team will immediately notify not only their superintendent, but also the Northwest District Health Unit. The health unit is providing a list of suspected COVID-19 symptoms. As you've noticed since March uh, 13th, the symptoms that are correlated with COVID-19 have been increasing. So we will have the most up-to-date list provided by the health unit of those symptoms for which we need to take immediate action. Schools will immediately notify the parents and guardians if their child begins to show symptoms of illness. And I advise parents and guardians of the need for immediate pickup. So we are asking each of you to ensure that schools have up-to-date contact information uh, for you and for an emergency contact if you're not available to be reached. The room that the child or staff member was in will be closed until appropriate cleaning protocols can be implemented as directed by the health unit and this, the staff and students will be relocated to another area in the building. If there is a positive case, further steps will be ordered by the local health authorities and the public officer of health. That may include testing and similar measures um, will be required based on health authority instructions. If there is a confirmed case, they may also um, order other actions such as closure of the class, closure of the school, further notifications for additional testing, testing for additional contacts, contact tracing, additional disinfection of spaces, etc. All of that will be directed by the public health unit. And persons who test positive may not return to school until they are cleared according to public health guidelines. So um, one of the best things that parents can do this year in order to help ensure the health, safety and well-being of everyone is if your child is ill and is showing any symptoms to please keep them home from school. There's a second outbreak protocol as well for if um, the school is notified uh, because a child became sick overnight or a staff member became sick overnight and who needs to be notified um, and have um, areas of the school that would be required to be cleaned based on the last time the staff or student was there. Those outbreak protocols are provided to every single staff member and there will be training um, at the beginning of the year at that first PA day that will help um, all staff to know those outbreak protocols um, and we take those very, very seriously uh, because they are dependent on the health, safety and well-being of all of us. Um, we know that has been a lot of information. Um, so at this point, we will start um, uh, answering some of the questions that we've been receiving both in advance of tonight and throughout the evening. You can feel free to continue to submit your questions at questions at kpdsb.ca. Sheena, will you lead us through the question and answers, please? Hi there, everyone. Uh, the first question will be, uh, will Hockey Academy be running in the first semester? Hi there, thanks for that question. Uh, Secondary Hockey Academy courses will run as scheduled, uh, provided they have the um, enrollment that is adequate to run a course. Um, we are scheduling them with off-ice opportunities right at the time being, and uh, we'll hold off on on ice time until at least December. 
but as we did through school closure, um, there are ways to work on skill building and uh, delivering the program uh, through a off ice method. For elementary hockey academy, because I know that that's probably on the minds of those in elementary um, hockey academy programs, we are going to hold off entirely with the hockey academy programs until at least December, at which time we will reevaluate. This is because of the um, cohorting that the we have to make sure we reduce the number of contacts that students would have previously been exposed to, and so in order to keep our our students safe and um, to meet that requirement of the 50 or under student contacts, uh, this, the elementary program will be on hold for the time being. Thanks, Shannon. The next question reads, I have four children currently enrolled in school in French immersion. If I opt to do virtual learning in English this year, will they be allowed back into the French immersion program next year? Students who are registered in French Immersion will participate in French Immersion remote learning with a KPDSB French Immersion teacher. And if they leave the program to take English programming, they would stay in the English stream following that. Thank you. The next question is, my son has a hearing impairment. He wears hearing aids and has an IEP. He relies heavily on lip reading. It is our understanding that his teacher will be wearing a mask. This is a concern for us. We are wondering how this will be addressed. That's a great question. Thank you for whoever submitted it, um, and I'm happy to answer it. Uh, we have been working with our uh, procurement officer to procure masks that have clear portions on them that allow kids, uh, students who have hearing impairments um, that uh, are required and, and um, do need to be able to read lips. Um, so that they can clearly see the mouth of, of their support staff and their teacher. There will be consideration for kindergarten as well as we move forward, uh, if possible, to ensure that we support uh, speech language development. Uh, we have many students that receive um, additional support through a communication assistant or from a speech language pathologist, and uh, those masks, masks will be considered for that usage as well. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Um, the next question is, my child is in kindergarten. If we put our child in distance learning, does the school board supply a device for my child's use? Schools will be supplying students with Chromebooks for remote learning. We also may be able to support some families in accessing Wi-Fi if that is a barrier to their, partic sorry, to their participation. Families would reach out to their school principal if this was the case to discuss and uh, we, we did make it part of our planning and our budget to purchase additional devices for schools because we know that it will also be a consideration if we find ourselves in a full remote learning model for all students. So, so yes, we would be able to provide uh, to loan a computer to a student to participate in remote learning. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. The next question asks, will there be live streaming classes with opportunities for interaction, i.e. live cameras in the classroom? Um, so we, because we're waiting on survey data, we know that um, the, the participation in courses, particularly at the secondary level, is, is critical uh, for the, the subject-specific learning. So it, it will be once we have our family survey data completed and back that we will be able to uh, make those decisions. And again, those will be communicated through the school administrators to families, um, but synchronous learning is certainly part of the remote learning plan. It's actually a really important part of it. Thanks. Next question. Um, my son is due to begin kindergarten year one this fall. I am planning on sending him in person. As the shadow days in the spring were canceled, is there any plan to try and host some shadow days or provide a slow entry for first year kindergarten students? So schools will be reaching out to the families of year one kindergarten students because we do recognize that some schools, while they did virtual visits, in the spring um, through school closure, um, 
that they it, it's important that students still have that opportunity to have that gentle entry it's it's very important both for the students and the families we we know that so you can expect to have outreach from the schools and alternatively um, if in, in waiting for that to happen you can contact your school principal um, to help make arrangements that are best for you because we do know that for some students individualized plans are are really important for that entrance to school Next question, um, if we choose to change our enrollment type to in class from online, as the example, uh, one of the predetermined dates, will our school be able to accommodate increases in in-person class sizes and still maintain physical distancing guidelines? Thank you for that question. I know that that's a key priority that's top of everyone's mind. It is part of why we really need um, families to make um, their intentions clear uh, during the survey so that we can um, staff appropriately for both in-class and remote learning. And the reason that we have set dates that you can, um, for the predetermined dates, where you can change um, from one type of learning to the other is to allow us to be able to restaff if necessary. Um, so again, I just wanna highlight that survey data and those uh, windows that Superintendent Lower talked about for letting us know your intentions are key in order to ensure um, that we're able to maintain health and safety protocols for all. Thank you, Sherry Lynn. Next question, who is doing lunchtime supervision and what screening or training are they being given? Great question, thank you, Sheena. Um, lunch hour supervisors uh, will be required to abide by all of our uh, health protocols, including a daily self-assessment. Uh, they'll be provided training by their school-based administrators or a designate of the administrators. Thank you. Will parent councils still operate? Yes, parent councils will still operate. They're integral to the operations of our schools and um, we look forward to meeting with them again. We did continue to meet during the uh, online virtual uh, learning. Um, we the Parent council meetings will likely continue to be in a virtual format until we are notified by the medical officer health of health or the, um, the ministry that we no longer need to limit um, visitors um, and others into the school other than students and staff who are learning there on a daily basis. So yes, they will continue, um, but they will continue to meet virtually. Thank you. The next question, uh, will there be any sort of grade nine orientation or tour activities um, prior to the first day of school? Thank you for the question. Um, we recognize that the transition from elementary to secondary is a very important transition. And yes, um, secondary administrators and their staffs will be planning for transition and team building activities for their um, new grade nine students. When that will happen, I can't say for sure, um, as we have to um, make sure that all the safety protocols and cohorts are in place first, but um, it will come, yes. Um, we've been asked to uh, explain a little bit the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning. I can do that, thanks Sheena. Synchronous learning means learning at the same time as the rest of the group, whether that's the um, entire classroom, uh, whether it's um, with a small group or it's real time one on one with the teacher. And we know that during school closure, we had a combination of those types of opportunities uh, from a, if, for a remote learner there could be possibilities of synchronously learning with a class that's taking place in person, or it could be exclusively an online instructor. And again, the family data, data that we collect through the survey will help to inform how we do our staffing. Asynchronous means on your own time, basically. Um, and so that would look like uh, work that is assigned through a virtual learning environment, such as a Google Classroom, 
um, through email, through phone call, depending on the ability for connectivity for students. So asynchronous is more um, assigned by the instructor and, and it could include recorded video instruction that students are able to watch on their own time. Um, so they still have the possibility of watching an instructor or sorry, a teacher do an instruction or a demonstration and a lesson and um, that students watch that at a time that is individualized to them and complete the work task assigned to that. So that's what we are when we're referring to synchronous and asynchronous. That's what we mean. Thanks, Shannon. What type of training is being provided for staff in terms of the language or discussions and education around COVID-19? Excellent question, Sheena, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to share that Schools Mental Health Ontario that supports every school board across the province um, for the implementation uh, uh, of, of mental health priorities to develop mentally healthy classrooms has been working diligently all summer long with a variety of working groups to create a return to school set of resources or toolkit for every level of the organization, starting with the director and trustees right down to the frontline classroom educator. In the anticipation, and we do anticipate um, uh, students coming, returning to school, whether it's virtual or face-to-face -face, with lots and lots of experiences and stories to share, some being very, very traumatic and very, very emotional. Um, schools Mental Health in their toolkit for frontline educators and support staffs and administrators in the front lines have developed a set of resources that um, provide very explicit scripts, uh, social emotional learning responses to appropriately, sensitively, and compassionately respond to these kinds of experiences and stories that the students are going to come to school with um, and um, make every effort to respectfully respond um, and engage students in appropriate discussions at the classroom level. So those resources are, are in the process of being rolled out. Um, they are not all accessible and fully um, uh, developed at this point, but they should be in the hands of educators prior to the start of school. Thank you. Uh, next question says, I would just like to let it know a little bit more about relationship building. My son tends to gravitate towards friendships with younger peers. I am a little concerned about his ability to make friends within his cohort. I would just like to know what relationship building techniques could be in place. That's a really good question, and I think it's probably a question on the minds of many parents, particularly in elementary, um, because cohorting for some students might mean making new friends. Our teachers and EAs, DECEs, and all of our support staff work so hard all of the time to help students feel safe, connected, and valued at school, and COVID-19 will be no different. Uh, some examples of strategies that may be put in place to facilitate new friendships, particularly during unorganized classroom time, um, which can be the more difficult time for students to adapt to new uh, friend groups outside. Um, so things like buddy activities, uh, new pairings of, of students within the classroom so that hopefully they um, form some relationships that carry on during the unstructured times facilitated group play activities. And then also for students that are really struggling, we do have all of our same supports in place that we would during the regular school year, such as access to school counselors, family navigators, our special education resource teachers, educational assistants, and other caring and trusted adults in the school environment. Thanks. Um, next question reads, my child was going on the Toronto trip this school year. I am wondering if this is still happening. Thank you for that question. I know that um, those are exciting um, opportunities for kids. And certainly when I was in school, those are some of the best memories that I have of uh, of my time in school. It is unfortunate, but at this time we have been directed by the ministry to cancel all field trips. 
Um, we could certainly revisit that in December if things change, but at this point in time, um, unfortunately, we will not be able to uh, do trips. Next question. We're wondering about online learning and what it's going to look like, especially for kindergarten. Will it be taught by the regular teacher? If so, how, when will online learning take place if teachers are already at school and in teaching in person? It's a multi-layered question. Um, I was very fortunate during school closure to be invited to, to participate in a virtual kindergarten class. So I can speak to it from experience. Um, the, the online, it, it's very hard to imagine. And I have a lot of compassion for parents with students starting school because this is absolutely atypical of what parents imagine their students' first experience to be. However, I can tell you through my own opportunities to be an observer and a participant that online kindergarten was still a great deal of fun. It was just very different. Um, so things like, uh, and we talked about synchronous, so live sessions with the teachers and uh, DECEs, um, sorry, those are the early childhood educators that are the pairing of the teacher, um, paired up with the teacher in the kindergarten classroom, providing stories, songs, art and drama activities, virtual field trips, um, as well as working with families for suggestions of asynchronous activities that can happen, such as outdoor play activities um, and follow up to the instruction that happens live online. As far as the teacher goes, again, it's really dependent on the family survey data um, to know how many students we will have joining us remotely as to how we go about staffing it. There, there is the possibility that it could a student could be connected to the teacher that they would return to in their classroom in their home school, but it is also possible that we may have teachers that are exclusively teaching online and it will be dependent on how many students we are supporting in that learning method. So I hope that answers the question. Our students uh, to bring school supplies from home, this question is grade one elementary, or is the school going to supply the students uh, with what they need? Um, at KPDSB, we always provide our elementary students with all of the supplies they need, and this would be no different. Um, as, as always, some students prefer to bring their special um, pens and pencils and markers. However, um, as I said earlier, equity is extremely important to us, so we do provide uh, students with all of the supplies that they'll need. In saying that, we will have to make sure that supplies are labeled and kept for each individual student um, so that we have less points of contact um, or less um, sharing of supplies and, and possibly germs that way. So we will be labeling um, supply kits likely in the classroom and those things will be um, not shared items as they might be in other years. May I add to that as well, Sheena, that this year we are recommending that children bring um, a water bottle because water fountains will be bagged off. And so if each child has their own refillable water bottle, we do have um, the sensor um, uh, water filling stations that, uh, that they can use to refill their water bottles. Thanks, Sherry Lynn. I think this next one might be for you too. And I think we touched on it, but maybe just looking for some clarification. Um, will parents be notified when there is a positive case um, in their school or classroom? As a school board, because of the sensitivity of health data, that will be at the direction of the Northwest Health Unit. Um, certainly anyone uh, where there is uh, contact tracing required, will be notified directly by the health unit. So um, yes, you'll be notified if um, there is a concern that will come directly from the health unit and for those who would have come into contact. Jane, I think um, this is a secondary one. It says, will secondary students be allowed to go home over the lunch break or are they expected to remain on school property in assigned lunch spaces? Thank you, Sheena. Um, we strongly encourage that students stay at the school for the lunch hour. 
However, we do acknowledge that some students will choose to go home for lunch. Should a um, student stay in the school, there will be designated areas for classes and um, cohorts of students. Um, we are in discussion right now about the length of time uh, dedicated for the lunch hour because there's a possibility that the, that the lunch hour may be shortened slightly in order to uh, lengthen the a.m. and p.m. breaks. Next question is uh, for you, I think, Shannon. It's asking about fine arts. It says, will fine arts band instruction continue? Um, so this will be part of a school-based plan. However, it may be the case that bringing together a group of students for band may exceed the number of uh, direct or indirect contacts that students might have. And for that reason, we may need to put band on hold um, in, in maybe its traditional format. Uh, we, all, we do have direction from the Ontario Music Educators Associ Association in Ontario that helps to support and inform our planning, whether it's instrumental programs or uh, vocal music programs that helps to maintain programming for students during COVID-19, but make sure that it's done in a way that has been informed by public health to guide us. So you would watch for that kind of information in your school-based plan that will come out from um, directly from your school. And, um, and we've encouraged schools to reimagine programs where we can, but also as we've repeated many times during this presentation, the health and safety of our students and their families is, and our staff is very critical. So unfortunately that may mean putting a pause on some programs um, such as bringing a large um, group of students together for band. Thanks. Next question is around the OSSLT. Uh, it says, will last year's grade 10 students have to complete the OSSLT this school year? Um, I'll have to look into that question and that will it, the answer to that unless Director Farron has the answer um, already. I'll have to look into it and then uh, the message will be relayed to the schools and to the families. Um, last year's graduating students were exempt, but last year's um, students were not exempt. So only if they were in their graduation year were they exempt from the OSSLT requirement for graduation. They can receive that um, credential either through the OSSLT, which um, the ministry has indicated that they are looking at running twice this year, um, once in the fall and once in the spring in a virtual format. Students who were previously eligible and who did not um, were not able to write because of COVID-19 are also um, eligible to be uh, placed into the um, Ontario Secondary School Literacy Credit, um, which is a course that students take in place of the OSSLT. But last year, students who were not able to write do need the literacy credential in order to graduate. Thanks, Sherry Lynn. Um, there's a question around high school sports. Are high school sports happening this year? Um, and also music classes, which I think uh, Shannon talk, touched on a little bit already. Um, so I can uh, respond to that question. Um, we are, High school sports will continue in phys ed classes. We are meeting with our regional partners tomorrow to see if uh, regional sports will um, be able to occur. We have heard from OFSA, which is the Ontario Federation of Secondary Schools Association, and they manage secondary sports for the province. They have canceled all um, fall um, uh, sporting events and competitions. They will revisit again and see if they are able to do winter and or spring, but at this time, all fall Ontario, um, Ontario wide secondary school events are canceled. We will for the, because we know that it um, contributes to the mental health and well being of students, uh, try to continue with some um, athletics in schools based on a conversation with the health unit and uh, and with our schools, but we will have to be careful that they are sports that are 
um, not contact sports. So for example, football would not occur, uh, but cross country running as an example could still occur. A uh, secondary question um, says, my son is entering grade nine um, this fall. Uh, when will he be informed of which classes he will have to start the school year? Thank you, Sheena. Um, that's a very good question. And um, once the surveys are completed and uh, secondary school principals and their staff can see the number of students that are attending school um, in a uh, face-to-face, physical environment as and also the remote choice, then schedules but will be looked at and timetables um, jigged a little if that's necessary and then students will be notified of um, their upcoming school year timetable. Another one for you, uh, Jean, or maybe for Sherry Lynn, it's about volunteers hours for graduation requirements. It asks, how are children to get volunteer hours to graduate? Not everything is open and they were not able to do hours this summer due to COVID. Um, I'll start and, and um, Sherry Lynn may add to it, but um, there, there's a lot of, um, searching going on for virtual placement and virtual hours and guidance counselors and staff in the school will be working with students to um, provide some ideas and share some resources about how one may acquire uh, their 40 community service hours in order to graduate from secondary school. There's been a couple questions um, around uh, mask wearing. Um, we know we've talked about it's required um, 4 to 12 and encourage J or kindergarten to grade 8. Um, just families wondering about if their child's having trouble um, wearing a mask, will there be support at the school to help them get used to that? So um, one of the things that I'm going to speak about in my summary as well is um, the importance of helping your child to become accustomed to wearing a mask and practicing and building up the amount of time that they're able to um, wear a mask prior to school starting. And I think um, that will be really helpful. Um, if your child has medical reasons um, or sensory reasons, um, for which they cannot wear a mask, they can speak with the school, well, you can speak with the school principal, um, and together you can determine um, there are some exemptions available. Um, in addition to that, we will be scheduling outdoor time and outdoor breaks. Um, the health unit has indicated um, that, sorry, the Public Health Officer of Ontario has indicated that if children are outside and they're more than um, two meters apart, that it's a good time for them to have a break from their masks and to be able to take them off um, so that they can have a, a, a bit of a break during the day. Um, but one of the health and safety pieces that we will be including um, with our instructions, so we have training at the beginning for teachers. There also will be training um, for students, and one of uh, those pieces of training will be how do you wear your mask? And so um, we look forward to working together to support kids in, uh, in wearing their masks at school. A uh, question from a parent of a graduating grade 12 this year. Um, just wondering if bursaries, grants, scholarships, um, application processes to post-secondary, if we know of any changes that could happen this year with those. Thanks, Sheena. Um, no, we don't expect any changes to happen with um, the list that you read out. No change. We do have a question around um, school bus transportation and um, having filled out the survey to indicate um, that you will be using the bus. Uh, the question is, did that filling out that survey register for the bus? Um, if they weren't using the bus last year, do they still need to call and register? I'll take that question, Sheena. Um, if you filled out the survey, um, and you opted out, then that will be an opt out at this point. However, they are doing registration through the parent portal of the transportation consortium. So they will be sending out um, 
emails and blasting out on social media for people to go into the parent portal to register officially. Thanks, Richard. Um, question from a secondary parent. Uh, will secondary school students be permitted to leave and return to their classroom group for purposes of attending doctor or dentist appointments if it's approved by the parent guardian? Um, so that's a good question. I haven't heard that question yet. So um, for doctor and dentist appointments, um, if scheduled, then I would um, imagine that in the offices of uh, any medical professional that it would be safe and safety protocols would be followed. So yes, students would then um, return to class and sign in in the protocol that's um, set up by the school administrators in the school. Thank you. Uh, will there still be tutoring offered to students at school? Um, I can answer that, Sheena. That is something, for our formal tutoring programs are something that we receive information from the Ministry of Education, usually after the beginning of the school year. Um, and then when we have that information, we um, have parents, or sorry, outreach to parents through the schools um, when, when we know we have funding for the programs in place. Uh, however, um, just re with regards to intervention or support for student learning in general, students are able to work one-to-one -one or in small groups so long as it doesn't um, increase their direct or indirect contacts with students beyond what is um, approved. So 50 for elementary and 100 for secondary. So um, it, whether or not we have formal programs in place, we're always looking for ways to support our students as are our um, special education resource teachers, our four directions coaches. So there are many ways to, for students to access support. Um, so whether or not they're through formal tutoring programs, we, it's very important to us that students feel supported with their academics. Thanks. Next question. Um, will schools be open after hours for students who use the library or classrooms uh, to complete their homework? I will take that one, Sheena. At this point in time, um, we will be planning for just the school day. Um, if we were able to manage that safely, as once we've um, done a return and review our processes, we may add that. But at this point in time, uh, students will be at school just for the school day. Um, next question, would my child be allowed to attend elementary school in person on a part-time basis? I would like them to attend three days per week instead of five days per week. Is this possible? Uh, Sheena, I'm not sure if they identified what grade they're asking about. No, I'm sorry, they didn't. Um, the reason that uh, I ask that is Sometimes that's typical for kindergarten students as they're entering um, kindergarten for families to make more um, a, of a gentle entry into school with a part-time schedule. Um, I would say for students that are um, outside of kindergarten grades one through 12 that it's, it's important that students, if, if the method of delivery is in person, that students do attend every day. They will miss out on learning um, opportunities if they are an in-person learning um, student versus a remote learning student. We won't have students bouncing between the different delivery models because, as we said earlier, it could actually mean that they're bouncing between different teachers. Um, and we know that uh, that inconsistency would not be uh, good for, for students and for their learning or their well-being. So um, kindergarten, that's a possibility, but outside of kindergarten, not, if, if it's in person um, that a family is selecting for their students, they would attend five days a week outside of sickness or, or days where they may be symptomatic um, and need to stay home. Thanks. What will elementary school drop-off look like? Will school start times be staggered? Um, so for the first part of the question, that will be part of a school-based plan that will be communicated out to families by schools prior to the first day of school. Um, buses are scheduled, their routes, 
I'd say as per usual, but we know nothing is as per usual right now. But um, what remains the same are the amount of minutes that students are having instruction during the day. So um, I would imagine that the plan for students to actually enter the building will look quite different because um, I don't know if you've been in an elementary school when the bell rings, but often it looks like children pouring through doors into their hallways and getting to their classrooms. And we know that we need to consider things like social distancing now. So I, I would predict that you'll see um, a, a protocol in place that only has one cohort entering the school at the same time. And again, it might be that we have staggered outdoor times and lunch hour. So, um, so we, if, if a concern is con hallway or entrance congestion, that will be a part of school-based plans to, to make sure that we don't have that. And sort of as a follow up to that question, um, there's been a couple of questions around, are students allowed elementary, I'm assuming, to play outside first um, when they arrive at school or are they required to line up and go directly into the school? Um, that would always be a school-based decision. Um, I, I have been at schools where, for instance, the kindergartens come directly into school every day when they come into school and, and some do play outside before a bell rings. Like I said, with the previous question, this will be a part of school-based plans because it does depend on the number of, we have some uh, smaller, more remote schools with fewer students that attend um, and social distancing is possible at any time. Um, for our larger schools, I think you can anticipate that you would see a, um, a very uh, a particular protocol in order to uh, mitigate any congestion. Okay, and I see that we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, we do have some questions left. Um, some are getting uh, um, pretty school specific, so we may respond to um, some of those directly from the school. Um, there is one more question. We talked a little bit about uh, volunteer hours. There's just a question confirming that it's 40 hours um, that students need to graduate. Yes. 40 community service hours are required to graduate. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Is there a maximum cohort size? It doesn't uh, specify elementary or secondary with the question. I can answer that if you like, Sheena. <clears throat> um, so there are maximums that are set by uh, the, the uh, Medical Officer of Health for Ontario. 50 direct and indirect contacts for elementary and 100 direct and indirect contacts for secondary. Um, we do know that class size in, um, in KP schools, um, on average, the um, secondary class size is an average of 19 and the elementary class size is an average of 21. So throughout the day, um, depending on the panel that you're in, whether they're students in your class or if they're students uh, that you come into contact with, um, there's a maximum number. Uh, I think we can fit one more in here. Um, this question is about ventilation in schools and classrooms. Um, what is being done uh, with those in, in that regard? Thanks, Sheena. I can uh, respond to that as well. Um, the chairs of district school boards and uh, directors of education had the opportunity to meet with the, um, the chief public health official in uh, uh, Toronto who's responsible for air quality. Um, we have been directed by the ministry to review all of our um, HVAC and air handling systems and to submit an analysis of that to the Ministry of Education and to upgrade all of our filtering systems to um, to manage uh, smaller particulates such as uh, viruses and bacteria. So um, that is underway and uh, I know that uh, Superintendent Finley and the, um, the plant and maintenance team are reviewing each and every one of KP schools. Okay, and it looks like our last one for the evening uh, is about hot lunch programs at elementary schools. Uh, the question notes that um, there's been announcements of secondary schools being grab and go. They're just wondering um, what this looks like at the elementary level. 
uh, with anything with regards to um, food, we always take direction from public health. Uh, and this is no different. Um, so we know that food plays an important role in all of our schools, elementary and secondary. So it's important that we will continue to provide those supports to students as we would have previously. Um, like you said, uh, Sheena, that some of the uh, breakfast programs, for instance, maybe grab and go. There are some programs in schools, such as Evergreen Kindergarten, where um, lunch is served during nutrition breaks for all students. Uh, that would continue. We just have to make sure that we don't have cross-contamination of um, you know, students reaching into all the same bowl of food, for instance, that food is served individually. It's done um, with all of the health protocols in place, but food programs will continue. We haven't heard any differently as far as the funding that's um, available to support those. In fact, it was enhanced over the summer um, throughout all of our communities. So um, I, I would expect that we will see very little disruption to that. Thanks. Um, so we have reached our end time. Um, there are still questions that are coming in, some questions around clarification of answers that were given tonight. So um, just for all of the parents on tonight, thank you for your questions. Um, if we didn't get to all of your questions tonight, you will receive a written response from us. Um, so you will get an answer uh, from us. So um, in summary, I wanted to let uh, all of you know that um, at KP, we will be following all the Chief Medical Officer of Health um, of Ontario guidelines, as well as um, ministry advice and requirements. And we want to give a special shout out to the Northwestern Health Unit, who every time we've asked them to review and revisit a plan, um, have been there with guidance and advice and support and direction for us. I would also like to thank the senior team for all of the work that they have done in order to uh, prepare for a safe uh, reopening for our students and families. We also have a COVID operations committee and it has a number of subcommittees that has staff from a variety of schools and a whole host of different um, roles and responsibilities who have all contributed to um, the plans for uh, KP. Um, as Sheena indicated, we believe that open and transparent communication is critical between um, parents and families and the schools and school boards, open and transparent two-way communication, because it is the way that we will all keep one another uh, safe together. We welcome your questions. If you continue to have questions after this session, if you think of something you wish you would have asked tonight but didn't get a chance to, please continue to use the questions at kpdsb.ca. Check back regularly on our website because in addition to direct responses for some very specific individualized questions, we are building a frequently asked question resource um, for parents and guardians. We also want to remind you of the critical importance of completing the survey by August 17th. We really need those responses to be able to plan both for bricks and mortar and virtual learning. And we need um, to know which students and how many in each class that we are planning for so that all of our health and safety protocols are in place and practiced and ready for that first day of school. Um, so we ask for your support in please making a decision um, in in terms of the way that your child will be attend, attending school. And as we indicated at the beginning, whatever decision that you choose is the right decision for you and your family, and we will support you. We would also ask for your support in a, a variety of ways um, as you help to prepare your students to come back to school. If you, um, could help them to practice and wear masks properly, um, as we indicated earlier, especially for the younger the students, um, the more important it is to help with that practice before school starts and to talk about with them proper respiratory etiquette. For example, if they need to sneeze and cough and they're in a classroom to, to sneeze or cough into their elbow. 
Um, we would ask if your child is returning to school, there is a requirement for you to screen them each day for COVID-19 symptoms. There is a link on our website to the Ontario screener. And we would ask to, if they are sick or showing any symptoms, to please keep them home from school. Similarly, if they've had contact with anyone who was diagnosed with COVID-19, please keep them home from school. It is our collective um, responsibility to one another to make sure that we um, stay home when we're not feeling well. Our staff will be following that same protocol. We would ask as well that you please follow all pickup, drop off and visitor protocols that your school establishes. Those protocols are in place to help reduce the risk and spread of infection and transmission and also to stay informed, to check that KPDSB website regularly. Tomorrow, a link of the recording for tonight's session and a written guide for families will be sent out. We know this is a lot of information to take in. Again, we'll, we encourage you to continue to submit questions and we will be extending the deadline for the Red Lake area um, for their registration as we know that right now, they are dealing with a lot more than getting ready for back to school. We will not set the date um, for their deadline until we know what's happening and until the fire is under control. Um, so the Red Lake area will remain open for registration. And again, our thoughts are with all of our staff, our students, their families, and the community of Red Lake as they deal with this crisis. Finally, I would like to um, thank all of you. I know that um, our parents were key partners with us as we moved to virtual learning and the support that you provided for your children. And we, we look forward to continue to working together with all of you to support the health and safety and well-being of your children, our staff, our students, and our community. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us um, and um, also on behalf of the trustees who I would like to thank for their significant support for this entire time throughout virtual learning um, and uh, moving into um, back to school planning. Um, we'd like to thank trustees for their support and ongoing um, concern for our students and families and their safety as well. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a good night and uh, we look forward to seeing our children and families in the fall.